You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome to This Week in Space. I'm David Waters and we begin with the arrival of a spacecraft that aims to tell us how the universe formed. The $2.1 billion Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer arrived at the Kennedy Space Center as it gets prepped for its flight to the space station. It will be mounted on the space station to search for antimatter, dark matter, and strange matter. And it will also search for cosmic rays. It's a spacecraft that almost never made it to space after being built. The mission to fly it was canceled after the Columbia accident in 2003. But AMS had some strong supporters in Congress, and NASA managers reshuffled plans to fly it. It's the last big piece of space station hardware to go up on the shuttle. We have checked and rechecked and double checked the detector. And we're now quite confident it will stay on the space station for its lifetime. And so for the next 20 years, when you look at space and you see the space station and you will see there is one detector, a very, very precise detector that will be there to collect data. AMS is scheduled to fly aboard Endeavour on what at the moment is the last scheduled space shuttle mission, set for February 26, 2011. But first things first, before STS-134 delivers the AMS to the station, Steve Lindsay and the STS-133 crew will be visiting the orbiting outpost on Discovery's last flight to space. That mission is currently slated to lift off November 1st. OV-103 is currently in its orbiter processing facility undergoing final preps for rollover to the VAB on September 8th. The media recently got a chance to take a look at some of the cargo that the crew will be taking up to the ISS, including Robonaut 2, as well as the permanent multi-purpose module and an express logistics carrier filled with spare parts and supplies. The crew was recently at KSC for a crew equipment interface test. That's the last chance for the crew to personally look over the orbiter and payload before flight. For these final missions, NASA is getting the public involved in selecting some of the wake-up songs that rouse the astronauts out of bed every morning on orbit. Good morning, Atlanta. Traditionally, NASA. crew members, family and friends make the picks, but now you can get in in the action too. Check out the song contest and you can find that link on our page. That's spaceflightnow.com slash twist for details. And a final word before we leave shuttle behind. NASA has not yet officially announced whether or not Atlantis will get one final flight next year. But they're kicking a prospective schedule, so you might want to pencil in June 28, 2011 on your calendars for STS-135. We'll let you know when you can ink that in. Meanwhile, in space, things are getting back to normal and science activities have resumed now that the station's radiator problems have been put to bed. With flight engineer Shannon Walker at the controls of the station's robotic arm, astronauts Doug Wheelock and Tracy Caldwell Dyson conducted three marathon spacewalks to swap out a failed ammonia pump that shut down half of the station's cooling system for a couple weeks. That was earlier this month. The spacewalkers hit some frustrating snags while trying to disconnect the broken pump, especially a balky ammonia line called M3, which repeatedly got stuck in place and leaked ammonia as well. Afterwards, Wheels said the secret to their ultimate success was going out of the hatch with the right attitude about unexpected problems. I think the, the, the greatest uh, thing that I've learned in, on my earlier EVAs is just to expect that. Uh, just take a deep breath. You know, think about the things, uh, uh, different ways that, uh, that you can finesse the, uh, the piece of hardware and uh, listen to what the, your ground uh, trainers are telling you from the ground and, uh, and don't give up trying. And, and so we, we kept at it and uh, yeah, M M3 became my giant through this whole thing uh, that I had to face out there and, um, and uh, we did it together and, uh, and we, we needed both of us on, on either end of the line to get it uh, you know, just find that sweet spot to to mate it up and demate it as well, and so um, so I don't know. It, it 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 sort of became it became the villain for us, and and so uh, we need we needed a uh, villain to cut it, sort of fight against when we were out there, and uh, and uh, it became a real challenge for us. Uh, but uh, we were able to rise to the challenge as a team. SpaceX has conducted a high altitude drop test of its Dragon spacecraft, designed to ferry cargo and eventually crew to the ISS. 
An Ericsson air crane helicopter dropped a Dragon test article at an altitude of 14,000 feet off the coast of California to test the capsule's parachute system as well as recovery operations. SpaceX says the exercise met 100% of test objectives, always a good thing to hear. SpaceX successfully launched a Falcon 9 rocket carrying a dummy Dragon spacecraft into space this past June. The company is planning another launch later this year that will put an operational Dragon into orbit and return it to Earth. The Mars Science Laboratory rover, also known as Curiosity, continues to take shape in its cleanroom at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Engineers have now attached its robotic arm. It was so heavy, how heavy was it? Well, it was so heavy that they had to hoist it into place using a crane. The arm is tipped with a suite of instruments, including a camera, a spectrograph, and a drill that will core out and deliver samples to other instruments on the rover's deck. Curiosity is set to launch to Mars late next year. And speaking of Mars launches, it was 35 years ago, ooh, that's when I was born, that NASA launched the Viking missions to Mars. Viking 1 on August 20th and Viking 2 on September 9th, 1975. Each probe consisted of an orbiter and lander. In their day, Viking 1 and 2 were the most successful interplanetary probes ever deployed to the Red Planet, beaming back color images of the Martian surface and scooping up soil samples for analysis. It would be nearly 20 years before Mars Pathfinder returned for further exploration of the surface. The holy grail for astrobiology buffs is finding an Earth-sized, Earth-like planet. That hasn't happened yet, and of course we'll be leading the show with it when it does. But there are a couple of interesting developments on the planet hunting beat this week. Scientists working with the Kepler spacecraft have identified a planetary system. That's the one orbiting a sun-like star called Kepler-9. The new solar system includes two Saturn-sized gas giants and possibly a slightly larger than Earth-sized planet orbiting very close to the star. No chance of Earth-like conditions, though. It's just too hot. Also this week, researchers working with the European Southern Observatory announced they've identified a solar system with at least five and maybe as many as seven planets orbiting a sun-like star located 127 light years away in the constellation Hydrus. And one of those two unconfirmed planets is thought to be roughly Earth-sized and also orbiting very close to its sun. Again, too hot for life. So we've got new solar systems breaking out all over. No pale blue marbles, though. Erupting volcanoes have been in the news this summer. And no, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name of the volcano in Iceland. But take a look at a cosmic volcano erupting out of the black hole at the center of galaxy M87. These images from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, combined with radio telescope data from the Very Large Array, show the black hole blasting gas and energy out. The good news, air travelers in Europe will have nothing to worry about with this volcano. It's 50 million light years away. A man who has been looking up at the cosmos most of his life has died. Confused about the cosmos? Can't tell a planet from a star? Then give us just five minutes, and we'll show you what they are. Jack Horkheimer, stargazer, tells you all about the night sky and the biggest show of all, the universe. 72-year-old stargazer Jack Horkheimer was director of the Miami Museum of Science and Space Transit Planetarium for 35 years. He's most well-known for hosting a long-running astronomy show on PBS called Stargazer and at another time Star Hustler. Horkheimer promoted astronomy for the naked eye on the show, which ran each week from 1976 until now. In fact, I grew up watching that show. The latest episode, which is his last one, shows you how to spot three stars called the Summer Triangle. You can go outside and do that any night. Just watch the show first, and it's worth a watch. You can see it by visiting our page at spaceflightnow.com slash twist. And as Jack said at the end of every show, keep looking up. That we will, Jack. And finally, we leave you with this time-lapse video of Earth from space, shot by NASA astronaut and Mr. Saturday Morning Science himself, Don Pettit. I've spent my whole career in TV, and I can tell you most everything looks better in Fast Forward, including me, actually. Turns out Earth is no exception. Night is even cooler than day. Check out those green auroras when they zip by. Absolutely incredible. 
Pettit is headed back for a second tour of duty on the ISS next year. What are you going to do to wow us next time, Don? It's going to be hard to top this. Time for us to hit the stop eject button this week. Thanks for watching and please check us out regularly. Also, please think about tossing us a few bucks at spaceflightnow.com slash twist. There are five of us working on the show now and we're kind of singing for our supper here, so we appreciate your support. You can send us an email as well, twist at spaceflightnow.com. Tweet us at This Week in Space. Check out the blog at milesobrien.com. Thanks so much to our sponsor, Binary Space. We really appreciate your ongoing support. Join us next time for all the news off the planet. I'm going to vacate the hot seat here. Miles O'Brien will be back, and we'll see you then.